Today, I'm going to be talking about SharePoint events, the event receivers that we have available in SharePoint 2010, um, which are slightly extended from what we had in 2007. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to quickly go through some introductory material about uh, what's available, what kind of event receivers that you can tap into. I'll briefly mention feature receivers because that's the number one catch-all and you'll be writing those all the time. Uh, but once you understand how the process works, it really doesn't matter whether it's an event receiver or it's, a, it's an actual event. Um, you're going to run some imperative code when somebody does something, right? There's only two ways to start code running. Who can tell me what they are? Two ways to start road code running. Somebody yell it out. Timer jobs because time passed. Right, so one way to make code run is because, hey, it's Thursday morning, 9 a.m., let's run some code. A timer service. And the second way is an event happened. That's it. Those are your two options. Either time passed or somebody clicked on something or somebody hovered over something or somebody deleted something or somebody uploaded something. Something happened, and so we need to make some code run. That imperative logic is something that you can use to do whatever you want to do. The sky's the limit, right? It's, it's beyond just what can I do in SharePoint. Event receivers give me the ability to do stuff in other systems, right? I can, I can kick off workflows if I want to. Oh, let me make a big distinction here, though. What's the difference between a workflow and an and event receiver, right? An event receiver is code that's going to run right now in the same HTTP request, uh, if it's synchronous anyway, right? such that this code is going to execute and be done. There isn't any state. It's not going to hang around. It's not going to start running again tomorrow. Right? A workflow is more long-lived. Yes, you can make workflows that run right now, run from start to completion, and do the exact same thing an event receiver does. However, there's nowhere near as many options to kick off a workflow. Right? There's only three ways to kick off a workflow. Because somebody said, start a workflow, because somebody uploaded an item, or because somebody uh, changed an item. That's it. Those are the only ways to start a workflow. So we're going to see that event receivers can run in a lot more contexts. However, they're immediate. right? They run right now, and then they're done. They don't hang around, and you don't get any state management, stuff like that. So I'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of an event receiver. I'll talk about the different types of events that we have, how to deploy them, because there's three different approaches that you can use, the new events to SharePoint. In fact, I'll talk about all the events, and I'll call on you to help me to identify the missing events, at least the missing ones from Todd Bleeker's perspective. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the new stuff that it's got. Um, when I teach my dev course, uh, I always start out by saying, hey, if you're a .NET developer, you already kind of know the basics that you need to know in order to do SharePoint dev. Right? It's the same three high-level step process that we use in almost all .NET development. That is, first, we need to get our imperative logic built. Right? So we're going to make a DLL. What's involved with making a DLL? You inherit from a base class. Right? Implement or override the methods or properties that you want to be different than the original base class. Right? And then deploy it to the right place. Oh, sorry. I got ahead of myself. So you're going to inherit from access and overwrite some methods or properties. Once you have your code, you need to produce that into a DLL so we compile. There's the, there's the third step in that process. So we make a DLL. In order to make SharePoint aware of that DLL, we write some XML, some configuration that says, hey, in this context, I want you to use my logic. And then the third step is put those pieces, the XML and the DLL, in the right place so that it can run. You do the same thing with ASP.NET, right? These are the high-level processes that we use for all dev. So in this case, when we make a DLL, we're going to inherit from an event receiver base class. We're going to say, we want to have a list event. We want to have a, an item event. We want to have a web event. Whatever kind of event we want to have, we're going to inherit from that specific base class. And that will give us a set of methods that we can choose from that we can override. The method that we choose to override is going to be what is the catalyst for making my code run? And I'll talk more about that in, in, a little, in, in depth, actually, on the slides. Um, once we've overridden that, then we get a property bag. It's always the same thing. The, properties ba or the property bag is called properties. And it's basically all the context for when this event fired. It's got a disparate set of, of uh, data that we can tap into, like who caused this thing to happen? What is the, the context in which the URL or the site or the list or whatever it is that this event is firing in will have that motley set of information that's given to us from in various levels. I'll give you an example. Um, 
if you've got an item, an item level event, then you're going to have in the properties the list that fired it, or the list on which it was fired. You'll also have a separate property called the list title. You're like, uh, hello, I can get the list title from the list uh, object, so why did you give me both of those? Well, probably because at some point the list title was needed, and so it was added to the list of properties that we get in this event. And then sometime later on, they came back and said, hey, we need the whole list. The list title is not sufficient. Right? So they couldn't get rid of the list title because many of us had already written code to use that title. So they just added a second object that was a little redundant. So just be aware it's a motley set of values. Okay? Um, the, the, the last thing I want to mention here is that sometimes you need to know that you can disable that event firing. The idea is that I'm updating an item, and in the updating of the item, I write some imperative logic to update the item which fires the update item logic, which and then you get into this whole cyclical thing. The good news is about six or seven times in, SharePoint will actually stop that loop automatically. It'll go, oh, I see what's happening here. This thing's just going to loop forever, and it will just cut it off, throw, an event, throw some kind of an error into the log, and, and you'll be recovered. Otherwise, it would consume your entire server, and then it would die. Uh, somewhere in that process, memory would get lost or something, and eventually your server would just say, I can't run this event anymore. So you can disable it and then re-enable it. Uh, to write some XML, all we have to do is make an elements file. Now, elements files are really commonplace, and they used to be difficult to do. In SharePoint 2010, with Visual Studio 2010, we can auto-generate uh, many of the elements files, and we get IntelliSense, and they get automatically included into the feature.xml file. So we've got the, um, the feature header and the feature details, or I like to call them the feature template and the feature definition. So this would be the declarative feature definition. We're going to declare a feature that says, we want to use an event receiver in this context. And oh, by the way, I've got to stick this in my pocket. Oh, by the way, um, here's the DLL, the four-part DLL name, right? The full name. So that's the DLL version, culture, and public key token, the full name of the DLL. And then you've got the namespace and class name. The namespace is like a folder inside of the DLL, and the class name is the specific um, the specific. I guess, element inside of there, bad, bad term. It's a specific class inside of there that you want to execute, the collection of methods and properties that you want to make available. Right? So that six-part name is what we use everywhere in SharePoint. This is what I use to identify it. Right? The four-part DLL name, the namespace, and the class name. That's true in every single place in SharePoint except event receivers. In event receivers, we add a seventh element. The actual method name has to go into the XML. So we have the full name for the assembly, the namespace and the class name, and the, uh, the actual method name gets included. So seven values have to go into this XML file, and I'll show you that on a slide. Uh, and then we have to deploy. We're going to use a WSP to deploy. In this particular example, I'm going to show you creating your own custom page. The big, one big problem we had in SharePoint 2007 was, hey, we can do these event receivers, but whenever we want to give feedback to the user that something's wrong or they need to do something different, the only option we had was to throw a string onto an error page. An error page wasn't always the best solution, so it's really nice that in SharePoint 2010 we can now say, oh, don't throw it to an error page, instead throw it to my custom page. So I'm going to show you how to do custom pages, which are really nice. Unfortunately, they're not well implemented, but they're really nice. So service pack, please, real quick, we got to get something in here. I'll show you of the nine different ways that you can kick off an event such that you end up on a custom page, seven of them are a different outcome. Yeah. Of the nine ways that you can kick it off, seven of them are different. I'll show you what that looks like. Okay. So the anatomy of an event. So something's going to happen. In this case, I'm going to say a user adds an item. Well, there's a before event, and those before events end in ing, right? So somebody is adding. That means it's a before event. Before events are always synchronous. No choice, they're always synchronous. Whereas the after event you can see there, item added, is either synchronous or asynchronous. In SharePoint 2010, they added the ability to make synchronous after events. In SharePoint 2007, they were only asynchronous after events. The asynchronous after events run in a timer job. A timer job is not in the same HTTP context, so who's running it, right? Well, it's some kind of God mode user that's running the after event if it's asynchronous. And if we're in a multi-user environment, what? Somebody might have come along and deleted the thing that we just fired off an event for the updation of. Right? So you have to be very, very, even today, even if you're running synchronous stuff, it's good for, to be very defensive in your code. Make sure that 
the thing exists before you try to update it or, or whatever, right? Because, um, because these events are firing in the background while many thousands of users could be interacting with that very same object in the database. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the, the third one down is when SharePoint does its stuff. Right, so we get to get in front of SharePoint, and then we get to get after SharePoint. Almost all of the before events are cancelable. So if it ends in ing, then you can probably cancel it. You can say, well, I know better than this business user does. There's this condition that exists, and they don't know it, but they can't do what they've asked us to do. So SharePoint, please don't do the thing that they asked. Instead, take them to my custom page. Right, so that's what I'm going to show you. All right, uh, of course, how many of you guys think... Uh, your business users are here instead of here. Nobody's got it. How many pe people think your business users are here, technically? Yeah, well, come on, get your hands up. Every one of you think that, right? Okay, guess what? We are end users of Visual Studio. So where do you think the product team thinks we are? Here or here? Yeah, so they gave us a wizard. So if you say... If you say, hey, I want to have an event receiver, of course, they don't just say, okay, here, you can have a class, and here, we'll go ahead and inherit from a base class. You're responsible for overriding a, vet, a, a specific method because you know it's really technically challenging to type override and choose the specific, event, uh, the specific, specific method that you want to override. Instead, they gave us a wizard. Now, can you plainly see that every one of the methods that you might want to choose to override is list? Oh, that's right, it's not. They gave us phrases, and from these phrases, you're supposed to identify whether or not you're picking the right method or not. Now, I tease a little bit about this one. Is this a red dot? I can't do, I don't know where a red dot is. Third one down says, an item is being deleted. Does that mean that they're deleting it or they've deleted it? Uh, wouldn't it be nice if it was just in parentheses that it said, item deleted? Oh, that's the after event. Oh, no, this one is the before event, item deleting. Right? It's in the process of being deleted, so that's item deleting. I find the actual phraseology that they use here really confusing. So pick something. What's great is that they actually implemented it much better on the next screen. So pick something here, and we'll, I'll show you in the demo how we can actually go into the properties of our spy, and we can manipulate these guys, and they'll auto-generate the XML for us, which is actually quite nice. Okay? So, there's uh, six different types. Workflow events are brand new. I'll talk about item, list, web, feature, and email. Real quickly now, um, you can imagine that there's a lot of events here. Uh, we're way, way beyond what we had in SharePoint 2003, right, where document libraries were the only things that had events, and there was only like eight events that you could tap into. So if you wanted those same events on a list, too bad for you, right? Now we get list and library events, just like we had in 2007, and uh, there's a whole plethora of events. However, I'm still not satisfied, right? Anybody, everybody like, well, that's really cool, but could you also include, right? So I've got a little missing at the bottom. I want you guys to help me identify which of the ones that we would like to see on here aren't here yet. So I'm going to be a whiner. Yeah, I know. I'm really good at whining. Uh, I got a, in, in both the 2007 and the 2010 betas, after the beta was done, I got a thing in the mail that said, you were one of the top 10 bug reporters. I don't know if that's a compliment, actually. Is You're a really good whiner, man. You fuss a lot about stuff. Uh, okay, so, so uh, tell me which of the things that you would like to see as events that should be on this list but aren't. Okay? There's two that I can think of that are missing. Say it loud. Oh, uh, security events. Yeah, he said group deleted. So absolutely, there are no security events. And for a guy who spent quite a bit of time writing a piece of security-based software in SharePoint, I can tell you it would be fabulous if you knew whenever somebody was changing who had access, removing somebody from having access, adding an individual rather than a group, you know, somehow changing the security stuff. Sorry, there are none. The only way you can handle security events, security events, is to use the... The fifth catch-all, I have five catch-alls, actually I have more than I have seven, but the, fifth, the, the first five are my, my primary ones. And the fifth catch-all, that is, I can run imperative logic in SharePoint even though the platform doesn't recognize it as a viable place for me to stick code. Okay, there's five of them, I'll quickly mention them. 
Hopefully I can remember all five of them. The number one catch-all, the one that you'll use more commonly than anything else, is called a feature receiver. The ability to run imperative logic uh, when somebody activates a feature or when somebody deactivates a feature. By the way, there's no slide for this. This is in a different talk. But I think it's, it's helpful for you to know the catch-alls. Um, the second catch-all is... Uh, I can't even think of any of them right in a second. Um, the first catch-all is a feature receiver. The second catch-all is a control feature. Why is a control feature a catch-all? Because I can run imperative logic in the code behind of a user control with or without a user interface on every single page view in SharePoint or every page view within a given context. So if you want to become a virus in SharePoint, write a control feature, right? Because now your code runs all over. Whenever anybody views a page, bam, you're running code. All right, number three, catch also. First one is feature receiver. Second, feature, feature receiver is number one, right? That's the one you should go to most often because it can be activated in so many different contexts. You can even activate it in your code yourself, right? So uh, a very, very powerful one. Second one is a control feature. Uh, third one is layouts. You can write an application page. Anything that you can do in ASP.NET, you can do in SharePoint, right? You have a folder called layouts. And layouts is effectively just a virtual directory in IIS. So anything you can do in .NET, you can do in SharePoint through the layouts folder. Be careful if you're a .NET dev thinking, oh, I have the layouts folder. I can just do .NET dev in SharePoint. No, 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 no. Don't forget the prime directive of SharePoint is to empower the business user to self-sufficiency. So if you just go start writing ASP.NET stuff and don't give the user the tools to build it themselves, right, then you're, you're missing the point of SharePoint. The page no longer belongs to you. Right? The page belongs to the business user. It's their surface to stick whatever they want on. Okay? Instead, you write the components that the business user puts on the page. Okay, I'm way off topic now. Okay, so you got the first three, right? Why can't I think of the fourth one? It's right on the tip of my tongue. Oh, master pages? No, that's not it. Although that could be used. Uh, okay, I'll have, to, I'll have to give a pass because I'm not thinking of it right this second. But the fifth, the fifth catch-all is what I call the catch-all of last resort. The catch-all of last resort is an HTTP module. HTTP modules are not supported. Why? Because they run outside of SharePoint. Here's the application framework. You're saying SharePoint runs here. I want to run my stuff here or here outside of SharePoint. You can make SharePoint look really, really bad with an HTTP module. It runs on every single request, not just for the page, but for the JavaScript, for the CSS, for the images, for everything on the page, right? So you have to be careful. But an HTTP module can sniff to find a particular condition, and then you can say, oh, this is somebody trying to do a security event. Let me go ahead and tap in and do something because of that. If I'm in the before, in the HTTP module that runs in the early part, then I could even cancel whatever they're trying to do and redirect them to someplace else because I don't want that, to, uh, that event to occur. So it is possible to build your own security events. Oh, I don't know how come that missing got messed up, but... Um, it is possible to make it so that the security events that, uh, that don't exist could be done inside of an HTTP module. Just understand you're in an unsupported mode. The only, the only thing in all of SharePoint development that I recommend from an unsupported perspective is an HTTP module. Because sometimes there's no other way to accomplish what you're trying to do. Just no other way to get it done. Right? But you can easily get back into support by just simply removing the line from the web.config. Right? Uh, just basically deactivating your feature or, uh, or retracting your solution and bam, you're back in support because that HTTP module is no longer being called. So because it's so easy to get back into support, I go ahead and say that those are okay. The last one is an item viewing. So we've got create, review, oh, no review. Update, delete, manage, all of those pieces are there, but no review. If you want to do review, here's what you have to do. You have to turn on auditing for the section where you want to do it, and all you get is after events effectively, right? It keeps track of everything that happened, and then periodically you can run a timer job that's going to go and read the audit log for when you, since you last read it, and figure out what people did from a view perspective, and then put out that information, or do whatever you want to do because they viewed it, right? So you only get sort of an after image of what, went ha of what happened. You can't prevent somebody from viewing a document unless you make an HTTP module. There's no other way to do it. All right, lists. Lists also have events. Unfortunately, uh, the list event list is not very big. It needs to be bigger than it is, so there's a bunch missing. Uh, field added, field deleting, field updating, in other words, schema management. However, for most things in SharePoint, should we be managing the schema on the list or on something else? Something else, so say it loud. Something 
Content type, right? Content type is your DDL, guys. Right, so as an ASP.NET dev, you're like, hey, where's my database? How can I define tables? How can I make some structures that the business users are always going to make use of and I can depend upon? That's called a content type. Don't use the read-only method. Use the static property of the fields that you create in those content types. And you can create your own DDL. You can have link queries dependent upon that content type because you know it will be used the same in every single context in which that content type shows up. Make sense? Okay, I, again, I'm way off over here, so sorry about that. Uh, so schema management. I, unfortunately, schema management is here on a list. By the way, on the six things, did you see content types listed anywhere? There are no events for content types. Somebody please write your, you know, your Microsoft rep and say, content type events? Anyone? Content type events? Those could be really useful. Um, all right, so when an item or when a list is added and when a list is deleted, Oh, praise God that they added this one because a list added was really, really difficult to achieve. But now I can run imperative logic whenever somebody adds a list. That's huge. However, what's missing? What, so let's just do it like this. So I'll just flip them up there. Uh, the metadata of a list, right? So things like, um, hey, somebody changed whether the version history is turned on or not. Somebody changed... Uh, moderation status of this list. So any kind of changes to the metadata about the list, that's missing. Um, document template changes. Hey, this is a document library and they're saying this. Uh, no, wait a minute, that's our corporate official document. You can't change that. I'd like to be able to cancel that kind of a change. Um, all content type events and of course all security events. Okay, so those are the ones I thought of. Anybody got another one that you thought of? This is not an end and all be all of the missing ones. I've had other people add some really good ones on in the past. Web events. By the way, notice that the very first one there is actually not a web at all. That's a site collection. <laughs> a site collection event that crept into the web events. How come that happened? Because it's the root web. Exactly. A site collection is basically just being managed from the top level site. Right? So the top level site is where the event is actually occurring. So it really is a web event. It's just if you're trying to delete a site collection, then that means that the root web is going away. That's why it's here. Uh, also, they, they, they created a new event called web adding. Uh, oh, no, that's right. They called it web provisioned. I don't know why they did this. Semantically, they're correct. It is the after provisioning event. But these are coupled together. It really should be called web added. If they had called it web added, we'd all know what they meant. And we could tell that these were coupled together. There's a brand new event. It's really sad, in my opinion, that they chose to make it so that they're dissimilar in name. But the, the, the fact is that web provisioned is the after event for web adding. Okay? Uh, it truly isn't an after add. It's an after provision. But why didn't they make the verbs consistent anyway? Because the semantics weren't really worth the difference, in my opinion. Uh, web deleting, web moving. Web moving is when somebody renames it because even today in 2010, they still don't just change the parent indicator. They take the web, make a complete copy over here, and then delete the old one when you rename it. You rename a web and everything gets copied over. I think it's just bizarre. What's missing? Security events, of course, right? And metadata events is the way I think of it. So all of the things that we know about a web, all of the details about it, its name, its, you know, it, what, is it on the quick launch or not, that kind of stuff, any of those metadata details are not capturable. People make changes to those and you can't do anything about it. Okay, unless you write an HTTP module, right? A catch-all of last resort. Okay, feature receiver. So this is the big piece where I'm going to talk about the number one catch-all, the feature receiver. Um, this is going to run code whenever somebody activates or deactivates a feature whenever somebody installs or uninstalls a feature. Those are really powerful events. The install and uninstall, those two, run on every web front end server. So if you need to touch the file system of every web front end server, consider feature installed or feature uninstalling. That will actually run a timer job on every single web front end to make sure that that happens, okay? Otherwise, feature receivers, uh, the, sorry, the uh, feature activated and feature deactivating, those only happen on one of the web front end servers, one of them. Um, also note that feature deactivating and uninstalling, those are before events, but they can't be canceled. Now, I don't know why these rules exist. I'm just telling you what they are. Um, I actually tried to press a product team member some time ago for, how come this one is so weird? At least they improved this. It's no longer... <coughs> Excuse me. It's no longer a, uh, an abstract base class. It's now got virtual methods in it so that 
You don't have to override every single method. If you don't override a method, basically nothing happens. Whereas in the past, you had to override every single method, even if all you wanted to do was nothing. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, now you can actually just say, I only want this one thing, right? And then, of course, feature upgrading. Uh, feature upgrading is new to SharePoint 2010. That's why it's green. Um, feature upgrading allows me to run code based upon the version of the feature so that I can say, hey, if the version of the feature is between uh, you know, one and two, or if this is version three, so you can either specify a specific version or a range, then I want to run this code. I want to run this logic. Um, there's both a declarative side of feature upgrade and an imperative side of feature upgrade. Um, if you're really interested in ALM and feature upgrading, go check out uh, Chris O'Brien's blog post on this. Uh, he did a seven part series on all the code that he, he uh, wrote for helping us to manage code from dev to, dev to test to production, right? And how feature upgrade would work. Probably the single most difficult thing to do with upgrading of features and solutions for that matter is um, in a disaster recovery situation where you've gone through five iterations in productions and I've gone, I delivered number one, I upgraded to two, I upgraded to three, I upgraded to four, I go to my disaster recovery and I deploy and all I get is four. I don't, they don't go through one, two, three, four. You've got to somehow write your own logic to say, oh, go to play one, then upgrade to two, then upgrade to three, then upgrade to four. That's the, that's the biggest challenge with ALM today. Um, it is still a very immature framework. It just came out with this release, right? So we're just learning the ropes about what the best practices are with regard to handling upgrade scenarios. But that is nice that there's an imperative place where I can put logic that I can use to upgrade my current solution. So I got both declarative and imperative kinds of upgrade logic. So what's missing here? All the ones that aren't listed, right? The, the flip side, the ings where there are eds and the eds where there are ings. So feature activating, feature deactivated. So right there's a feature activated. How come there's not a before activation? So before the activation takes place, how come I can't run code? How are you going to remember which eds are in and which ings are in and which ones are out? Here's how I remember it. It's not really a, an excuse necessarily. I think the product team could have implemented them, but I believe that the entire feature framework with regard to an imperative event process was written by, you know, Jim Bob, the guy on the, the dev team that never gets the stuff done. Because there's no, I, no rhyme or reason for why we have to do it this weirdo way, right? But there we go, we have to do it this weirdo way. So how can I remember which ones are in and which ones are out? Imagine SharePoint is this imaginary box in the center, right? And so if something initiates outside of SharePoint, like installing, hey, I'm stalling, that starts out here somewhere. SharePoint doesn't know about it until they've installed it. After the installation is finished, then installed is inside of the box. And so that one was implemented. Vice versa, when I'm trying to uninstall, it starts out in SharePoint. Start removing it from SharePoint. But after the uninstall is finished, then the ed happens outside, uninstalled is not implemented. That's how I remember it. Same thing for activation, right? So the, that helps me remember which ones are in and which ones are out. It's not really a pass, <laughs> right? But it, it at least gives me some mental picture for how I can remember that. Email, uh, most, what is it, six? No, uh, sorry, uh, half of the SharePoint lists are mail enabled. That means that I can give them an email address. What's really cool about that is if you're into email enabled applications, then your business users could have some email forms or some kind of system generated thing from another application that will communicate information into your SharePoint repository by email. Just be careful, it's a little brittle, right? Because you're sending data in via a, a tool that really isn't structured information. You're taking unstructured context and trying to make it a structured context. But to the extent that what can get sent in is structured, then I can. I can uh, mail enable my SharePoint application so that I can actually receive emails and post them into SharePoint. Lots of times though, what SharePoint does with that email is not sufficient. You want to do something more. Or you want to get this email and then you want to take action. You can take action with an email received. Um, what if the list that you actually want is not mail enabled? What if you want to send email to a task list as an example? What are you going to do then? Here's what I recommend. Go ahead and create an announcements list or something like that that does receive email. Email the announcement, and hide it from the business users, right? Make it so it's not available on the list of lists page, right? So you're gonna not see it, right? But when an email arrives, it's gonna run the after event email received. The email received event is then going to do whatever imperative logic you recommend to insert the task into the task list from the details in the email. 
And then the last step is to delete the item that got created from the original email coming in. So you just make an email proxy list or something like that that's hidden from the business users and is just there to shuffle the information into wherever you're trying to make it go. Um, I've used that several different times and it, it works slick. Right? It makes it so that the business users can use the, the environment that they need in order to generate new things in SharePoint, like new tasks in SharePoint, but they don't have to do it from the context of a SharePoint browser. They can do it from whatever tool that you know, generates that email. Be aware this is web scope only and you have to have incoming email turned on. If you don't have incoming email, then it won't, it won't, the email won't get there to fire the event. Okay, last one. Workflow events. Oh, I do have to tell you, this room just drives me nuts. Right now, what I can see in that clock is Nintex. So that doesn't help me very much. I have no idea how much time has transpired yet. Somebody give me a clue. How, how much time do I have left? Somebody be my timekeeper? Half an hour left. Okay, super. Uh, so workflow events. These are all brand new to this release of SharePoint. Uh, some of these, I can't even figure out what we would do with them. What's a business scenario you would use in order to do one of these things? And I'm like, uh, I, well, I don't know. A workflow started, but, well, heck, I can run workflow starting logic right when the workflow starts. It is an imperative context, so why wouldn't I just stick it in the workflow? Here's one reason why you might. You might do it like this so that this works for all workflows in a given context. So you don't have to put it into every single workflow. It's a common process that you're going to use across the, uh, across the bar. Um, uh, workflow unloading and loading. There's no way for you to know inside of a workflow when they're actually going to take that, serialize it, stick it in the database, and wait. So maybe you want to run logic when that happens. I don't know. Uh, workflow postponed. There's nothing in the workflow that you can use to detect when somebody postponed a workflow, only when they cancel it or when it abends. Right? So if you want to handle workflow postponed, maybe this is the best way. I wish they would just stick that inside of the workflow, but. Um, and then workflow completed, so again, it seems like a, a duplicate, right? Inside of the workflow, I could do that myself, so maybe this is across the board, something like that. So that's just some ideas about how you might use these, but it, just be aware. Here's what I think actually happened. Uh, the product team themselves needed these, so they exposed them to us. And they're like, well, you guys figure out what you might, <laughs> you might want to do with these. Uh, but they really, they really aren't necessarily something that, uh, that you, you, we've been dying for, right? This is uh, things that they already had there, and they just thought, well, let's just give them some more stuff. So, hey, I told them, if you can give me a feature or you can give me an event, I'll take an event every day over a new feature of SharePoint, because an event is an extensibility point that I, as a dev, can tap into and build whatever I need, right? Whereas a feature is only good if I need that feature. Uh, but they don't hear me because how well is it? To, I mean, how well can they market? Hey, there's seven new events. Because we don't have the money, guys. Right? The business units have the money. They're the ones deciding to go with SharePoint. We only get to say, well, if they only had, you know, a blah 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 event. If they only had security events, it would be great. The business users are like, hey, you're a dev. You can figure it out. <laughs> right? Okay, great. Uh, okay, so and you can see the scoping. Scoping is new in this release uh, for a site level thing. So you can actually now say, I want this um, event to not just take place on this web, but on all webs within a site collection. I think I'm going to say that in just a minute here. So, uh, so let me come back to that, that, that thought. I have a slide for it. So how do you wire this up? So I've talked about how you make the DLL. Now we're going to talk about how you write the XML. Right? The XML is going to be just a typical events file, or sorry, a typical elements file. Uh, however, you can see, wish I had a pointer, the, the seven different things that you put in there. See the assembly is the first four, right? And then the class name is the namespace and class name. That's the next two. And then finally, the type. That should be an enumeration. It's not, right? But the type is that seventh bit. It's the only time in SharePoint when you have to specify the method name that you actually want to call. That then is going to get wired up to run in, in some context. At the very top where it says receivers, that's the context. So in this case, we're going to do a receiver type of 104. Well, what the heck is a 104? Somebody knows. Starts with an A. Announcements list. So whenever an announcements list is encountered, we're going to run this. Right? So if somebody tries to, in this case, delete an announcement, the item deleting method will get run out of this particular assembly's namespace and class name. What about data? Data is 256 characters of freeform text you can pass in to your event receiver. <coughs> it reminds me of when we went from MTS to COMPLUS. COMPLUS gave us the ability to just pass in 256 characters of data. Why did they add that? Why is it here? 
it helps us eliminate hard coding inside of our assembly. Right? So I can now declaratively say, here are the things that I want to know about inside of my assembly. Right? So I'll show you an example of that in the demo, which I need to get to. Um, and then the filter. Filter is in the IntelliSense. Filter is in the SDK. Filter is uh, available on the internet-based documentation, but it's not been implemented. Uh, I worked on, I can't tell you how much stuff I did to try to figure out how filter worked, and then I finally went and asked one of the product team guys, and he said, oh, oh that's right, we didn't implement that. Well, then take it out of the documentation. Take it out of the IntelliSense. I don't want to see it there. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the way to do it declaratively. You can also say, I want my event receivers to be made available imperatively. Either way, whether you say declaratively or imperatively, um, you're going to get a new item added into the collection in the database. Okay, this is a yellow feature, a yellow feature. I, I know you probably don't know my color scheme. Um, I've got green, yellow, and red. Green features automatically get, get uh, updated whenever you update the bits that you originally deployed. So just a solution upgrade will get you there. Yellow ones, they make changes in the content database that are referred to directly from the content database during feature activation. During feature deactivation, they, those changes to the content database get undone for you. The housekeeping is automatic. So you don't have to do it. If you want to update it, you're going to push out the new stuff and then call upgrade uh, or deactivate and reactivate. And it'll, it'll cause that, those new bits to get used. Um, the third one is a red feature. Red features require housekeeping. And I'll hopefully get a chance to mention that to you in the, in the upcoming thing. Um, a red feature is deploy. When a feature gets activated, we provision stuff into the database. The database now has the content that we're running from, not from the file system. And when we deactivate it, it gets orphaned there. Like modules uh, are, are probably one of the key things that get, get automatically, or d don't get automatically cleaned up. You need to do your own housekeeping there. Okay, um, so how do I do this imperatively then? Well, get a hold of the receivers collection that you want. Oh, this is the anti-pattern for add, right? So there's the pattern for add that we use in most .NET circumstances, which is create an object in memory, set its properties, and then add it to a collection. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, right? That's just an add pattern. So create an object in memory, set its properties, and then add it to a collection. And you can't do that with receivers. Instead, you first have to add an empty and completely broken receiver to the collection. Yep. Then set its properties, and then call update. How many trips to the database did I make? Right? I had to go add to the database, then update a bunch of stuff in memory, then call update. That's two trips to the database. You don't have a choice. In order to create items, in order to create receivers, those two things require the anti-pattern for add. You have to add something into the collection first. So we're going to add to the collection, then we're going to set the same stuff, right? It's still the seven pieces we're going to set. Those seven pieces are going to make uh, the, the collection know which method to call and which assembly, you know, whenever this event occurs. Okay, so it's basically the same set of data. It's just written in an imperative context, usually in some other feature receiver. Right, so some feature receiver fires and adds this receiver to some other context. So it's a feature adding a receiver in some imperative way. Uh, so what's new? Synchronous after events. Uh, the ability to specify the synchronization scope is in the XML. So in the XML, you get to say whether the after event is synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, impersonation. We had a big problem in SharePoint 2007 with after events that were asynchronous because it's not running in the same HTTP context. Right, so here's the HTTP context. It knows who's been impersonated. We could do anything we wanted as that person in the before event. But what about in the after, asynchronous after event? How do we become that individual again? Well, we need a user token in order to create a new site collection that is for that user. How did you do that? We used to have to store it ourselves someplace. And in the we'd have to fire off a before event and save aside whoever did this just in case there was an after event to pick it up. Right? They've now added that to the property bag. So in the property bag of the asynchronous after events, we can check and see who that person is and impersonate them in a new site collection so that we can do whatever we want to the SharePoint database as them. That's big, right? That's, that's huge infrastructure change. Custom error pages, hopefully I'll get to show you how broken that is, but how cool it is. There's new events. We talked about each one of these as we went through the slides. Web adding, web provisioned, poor choice of verbs, but there you go, that's what they are. Uh, so embrace and extend, right? You just have to say, that's how they did it. I guess we're going to go with that. Um, and the other ones you see added there, list adding is huge. It's really big. Whenever somebody adds a list, you can now write imperative code. That's, that's a big deal. And now site registration, which I don't have there. Okay, so I'm going to do a demo. 
Hopefully I can get there quick. Uh, I only got like 20 minutes. Ooh. Let's see what I got. I'm going to flip into my virtual box image. There we go. Uh, I'm trying to actually do this in a, in a uh, what is it called, where you're, it's just, uh, my mouse is down here, and uh, have you ever had to, like, work on somebody else's laptop? That's what it feels like here, so. But for some reason, my uh, resolution is really high. Okay, so let's see, what is it? Anybody use VirtualBox? Control F, is that what I want? There we go, full screen. Yay. All right, so from this context, I'm going to actually walk you through an example. Here's what I want to do. I want to make it so that whenever somebody goes and tries to delete an announcement from the announcements list, we say, uh, you need to expire that item instead. But rather than taking them to an error page, I want to take them to a nice custom page that has my branding on it, that has my message on it, right? Rather than some kind of an error. Otherwise, you get calls to the help desk. Hey, I have an error in SharePoint. It turns out it's just your message saying you need to expire this item. Yeah, stop. It's not really an error. Um, all right, so this is my Visual Studio. I wonder if I change this resolution so that you guys can see it better. It just automatically changed it when I got hooked up to this thing. So I'm going to just bump it to 1024 by 768 to give you a little bit more visibility. Does that help or not? Well, can't tell. It just kind of squeezed it in a little bit, I think. What are you going to do? All right, so I'm going to go to the new project. Oh, you know what? I know why. Hold on a second. I want to just do one more thing. So if I just jump back out here one more time, and I go to this one, and I change the underlying screen resolution to 1024 by 768, then you guys will be able to see much better, I think. Me thinks. No, no difference. Still bad. Uh, OK. I'm not going to continue with that then. Um, okay, so I'm in Visual Studio. Now, uh, I don't know how much to tell you about stuff because there's so much stuff I can add value in when I'm talking through, through this demo. But the first thing I want to just mention is you're going to create a new SharePoint project in Visual Studio. There are really only four options. I know it's an illusion, right? It looks like there's more than four, but there's really only four options. The empty SharePoint project is the one you're going to use most commonly. Then there's the two imports, the import reusable workflow and import SharePoint solutions. And then finally, the one that you have to do is a site definition. All the rest of those are actually spies, SharePoint project items inside of the SharePoint project. If you add one of those from a project template perspective, let's just say you jump all the way down to the bottom here and you pick visual web part. What's going to happen when you make that new visual web part project is they're going to make an empty SharePoint project with a visual web part in it. What's the name of the visual web part? Yeah, visual web part one, right? What's the likelihood you want it to be called visual web part one? That means you're going to have to do what? Rename, refactor. What do you think the, the state of the tools are with regard to refactoring things in, in Visual Studio 2010? Not too good, guys. So what are you going to end up doing? You're going to delete Visual Web Part 1, and then you're going to add Visual Web Part with the right name. Uh, so why not start with an empty SharePoint project and then add a Visual Web Part? I'm saying it does not work very well. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> so all, and not only that, wouldn't it be nice if there was just four project templates here, right? Just simplify. We don't need all the rest of that stuff. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pick, uh, not an event receiver, but I'm going to pick an empty SharePoint project. I'll call this guy um, event receivers BPC UK. How about that? Um, so I get prompted with the wizard, which these are just two properties on the project, right? I'm going to go ahead and say, I want to do this on my BPC UK site. And I want to do it as a sandbox solution. My opinion, you should always try to use a sandbox solution. In fact, the product team recommends use a sandbox solution whenever you possibly can and only switch to a farm solution when you must because you should know why you switched. You can run sandbox solutions in the farm, but you can't run farm solutions in a sandbox. The bottom line is that there's no technical difference between the two, just whether a, a solution can run in a sandbox or not. Right? That's the only distinction. Visual Studio makes the distinction so that we as devs can know whether the solution that we're working on is sandboxable, if you will. So I'm just going to leave it as a sandbox and click Finish. Pretty much any business user functionality can be sandboxed, and any uh, infrastructure extens extensibility must be uh, farm. Uh, by the way, uh, so receivers, they can all be sandboxed, which is pretty cool. I always like to take the key.snk file and move it out of the way, just put it up in the properties here. That just gives me that vertical real estate back. 
Inside of here, I need to add two different spies, two different SharePoint project items. So if I right click on my project and say that I want to add a new item, the new item that I'm going to add is going to be one of the SharePoint project items, this spy. Now, the list of spies is incomplete. Sometimes you have to go after the empty element spy. The empty element spy will give you an elements file where you can type in whatever IntelliSense that you want. Okay? Uh, the other ones, uh, sometimes they've implemented spies that give us a little bit of help. In this case, an event receiver spy is available, and we're going to use that one. So I'm just going to call this one my, uh, let's see, this is my something receiver. I'll call this my monitoring receiver, M-O-N-I-T-O-R-I-N-G, my monitoring receiver. I like to suffix my spies with whatever kind of thing that they are, because then when I just look, glance at my solution explorer, I can go, oh, I see what's in here, right? And it's a really useful way for me to kind of get an idea of what's inside of my project. Here's that dialogue I told you about, because remember, we're not here. We're, anybody see Night and Day, the movie Night and Day? With me, without me, with me, without me. If you didn't see the movie, you should see it. It's a funny movie, but... Uh, all right, so third one down is an item being deleted, right? That's the deleting event. We want that one because we want to be able to cancel this. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that one, put an X beside it, and then click Finish. Oh, I didn't show you, but there's all of the events. You can drop down and pick List Events, Web Events, and so forth. They know about all the different events in this wizard, which isn't a surprise. So what did they do? They generated three things for me. They generated a class. Inside of that class, they're inheriting from SP Item Event Receiver, right? item event receiver. If I had done this on my own, I would have typed SP item event receiver myself. Uh, what if I type, let me just show you down here, I'm going to go override space. There's all my event receivers, item added, item adding, attachment added, blah, 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 right? So that's all I would have to do if I didn't have their little wizard thingy. Um, what about this though? What if I change this, receiver, this, this receiver to a, let's do a list event receiver. Oh, I could get to spell it right though list event receiver. Now if I type override, I'm going to get a whole different set of guys, right? But by changing that on this class that they generated, I mess up their little property wizard thingy. So let me show you what the property wizard thingy works like. Okay, I'm going to just back all that out, and I'm back to an item event receiver. Uh, you can see I've done an item deleting. The second thing that they generated for me was the XML. Remember the whole make a DLL, write some XML? Make a DLL, that's the class, write some XML, that's the elements file. Right, and then at the top you see the feature, that's to package it up so it can be activated or deactivated, and then they'll auto-generate a WSP solution for me to deploy it into SharePoint. If you're not deploying stuff on, if you're deploying anything on your SharePoint uh, farm that's not in a WSP, stop it. Everything that goes on your SharePoint farm should be in a WSP, a web solution package, right? You should not be deploying anything, including web config modifications, any kind of touch you do to your SharePoint farm should be through a WSP. Okay, uh, so um, I've got my elements, I've got my monitoring receiver, here's my elements file. They auto-generated this item deleting. Now watch this. So you can see there's only one receiver in my receiver section here, right? If I go to my spy and take a look at its properties, hey, I've got handle, the item added, item adding, and so forth. If I scroll down here, item deleting. Cool, that's what I wanted to see on the wizard. And check this out. I'm going to go ahead and double click on item deleted to change it to true. They auto generate the XML for me. It's really sloppy. You have to do a control, uh, control ED in order to make it look nice. But now I have an item deleted because I set that property of the spy so that it, it had a true under the item deleted. Now, if I go ahead and I undo that, set it back to false, they take away the XML pretty slick. I kind of like this feature of the way that the tool works. I didn't really like the wizard feature, but I like this. Um, if I go ahead and look at the class, what happened in the class? Yeah, item deleting was generated. They also deleted it or generated an item deleted. How come they didn't delete it when I set it back to false? Because I might have written some code in there that I didn't want to lose, right? So they just orphan that method and they don't call it. So the XML never refers to it. This is just, you know, if you did one of those, uh, one of those tools that goes through and sees where your dead code is, it would identify this method as never being called. That, at least theoretically, it would. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't need this method. I can just get rid of it. Um, I've, already, I've already written the logic in order to uh, do this item deleting, so let me just go grab that logic real quick. Um, it's, it's in a subdirectory here, item deleting. Copy that code. And I'm just going to paste it in over the top of this item deleting. So I'm replacing their item deleting with my own. 
All that I'm doing inside of my item deleting is something very simple. Um, I'm basically saying, hey, here's a message. Please expire this item instead of deleting it. Uh, go grab the receiver data. That's that 256 character string I told you about, right? That in the XML, I could go add my own. So for instance, if I went back to the elements file, inside of the elements file for this receiver, I could add a data section. In that data section, I could put in Todd or whatever, right? I mean, I could put in my own data. Here's the challenge. What kind of method are you going to use to talk to yourself? Some people do like tilde delimited strings, right? Some people do caret delimited. Some people do C data with XML. Be aware though, you only get 256 characters, right? So XML feels a little bit heavy here. Your XML inside of XML and all that kind of stuff, right? So how are you going to handle passing multiple um, things into your receiver so that you don't have to hard code these? I'll give you a super simple example. Let's just say that all we ever wanted to do was target um, the on hold announcements or something like that, right? Then I could just type in hold or, or new or something like that. Some mechanism by which I can say these are the ones I want to deal with. I want to filter out all the ones that don't meet this particular expectation. I'm going to show you how I'm going to use that momentarily, but first, let's just look at my code. So it says go ahead and switch on whatever the current receiver data is. Uh, if it says cancel no error, we'll run this one. If it says cancel with redirect, we'll run this one. If it says cancel or otherwise, we're going to just run the default. So this is the way we used to do it, right? If you've ever seen properties.cancel equals true, that's deprecated. We don't use that anymore. Instead, now we say the status has been set to a certain enumeration. So we can have different ways. We don't just always just cancel. We cancel with a specific way of doing it. If you want to say properties.cancel equals true, it will use the third one because that's le legacy code, right? It's, it's still going to be working. So I'm going to set the error message and we're going to set the status. Let's just see that one work, all right? Um, I have a rule. I've got what I call my 10 easy steps. Can't really cover all that depth in this 75-minute you know, period. But uh, in the 10 steps, we go through a series of, um, of common processes that you do every single time, like the three big steps, right? We've got uh, prepare your environment, create a project, configure the feature, and configure the package come right away at the beginning. Whenever you add new items, you want to make sure that those items are being dealt with properly. Well, we added a spy, a monitoring receiver spy, but we haven't dealt with our feature and we haven't dealt with our package. Uh, so if you double click on the feature, there's four things that we need to do inside of the feature. We need to modify its title so that it looks nice. So this is what the business user is literally going to see. The business user is going to see that uh, happen, it, or that's what they're going to see on the feature activation screen. I always just leave it as the project name until somebody tells me, that's no good, we need to have that say something nice. Right? Or make sure it's in the requirements documentation so you know as a dev what to put there. Because otherwise we come up with the weirdest things and they're like, we don't even know what that is. Okay, then you tell me and I'll write the, it's just a string. I can make it whatever you want. Second thing I want to do is evaluate the scope. What scope do I need? You only get four scopes and you must pick one. You can't say, well, I'd like it to be both web and site collection. Right? I think you should lean towards site scoped things as often as possible. Here's the, the, reason, the rationale there. Number one, your site collection administrators are more likely to know what a feature is and how to activate it. And they can activate it for all of the webs in a given context so that the people that are just using the webs, it just works, right? Second reason is because it's site scoped. You only have to do it once per site collection instead of once per web. Right? So if I'm trying to empower my business users, that's the business users that I try to target if I can. In this particular example, just for simplicity, I only have a single web, I'm just gonna leave it as web. Whatever scope I make it, I have a tendency to go ahead and, and name my feature by that name, web feature right here. So I wish I don't have my zoom it in, oh actually, let me just jump over and grab zoom it so that you guys can see that a little bit better. Oh, I don't have it on here, shucks. Um, all right, well anyway, so I named this web feature. I apologize for the people in the back that says web feature instead of feature one. A web feature gives me some semblance of an idea when I look at my Solution Explorer, I go, oh, I see, that's so that I, I can do web-based things. This will be activatable at a web scope. Um, yes, I know that that means that I can only have one web scoped feature, but 99.9% .9 of the time that's going to be sufficient. One of each one of these. If I want another web scope feature, I can make another project. And it's a good organizational technique anyway. All right, so I've got my web feature. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, and do the last thing, which is make sure that my item in my feature is the, the, the spy that we have, right? my monitoring receiver. Then I'm going to evaluate or configure my package. Inside of my package, I can see that my feature has been included in my package. It will get deployed. And SharePoint, or sorry, Visual Studio is going to automatically just deploy and activate my feature. Why? Because my project has properties. Let me get my project properties up here. 
that say that the deployment scheme for deploying things in Visual Studio and the, the, the default includes feature activation. You can see that the only other option that I get, unless I have CKS Dev installed, is no activation. So I don't want to do the no activation. I want it to go ahead and do all the right stuff for me. So I've completed the first five steps, and then you would write your code. Uh, I've got a, an inner loop that says code deploy test, code deploy test, code deploy test. Oh, add an item, configure the feature, configure the package, code deploy test, code deploy test. Add an item, configure feature, config you get the idea, right? All right, so I'm going to hit F. No, I don't want to hit F5. Uh, anybody like F5? Anybody? Microsoft thinks you all love F5. Microsoft believes wholeheartedly that F5 is the only way to do development. How many of you hit F5 on a routine basis? Some of you? Yeah, nobody? Okay, so how would you deploy this if you didn't hit F5? Uh, so I, I use the tool. I let, go, I go let Visual Studio do it for me. But if you just say Alt-BD, Alt-Build-Deploy, Right? You don't have to do the build. It'll automatically save everything. It will compile everything. It will uh, package everything. It will take the package, deploy it to either the farm solution gallery or the site collection solution gallery, and then it will activate the features within there. If that already exists, it will retract it. Or, sorry, it'll deactivate and retract before it re reproduces it. Right? So Visual Studio actually does a pretty good job there. So if this is all working, I went ahead and added an announcements list to a blank site. If I go to that announcements list and I try to delete it, I'm going to choose an item. Now, if you're teaching your users right, you're going to teach them that they should always use the ribbon, right? Always use the ribbon. I've got three rules about the ribbon. The first rule about the ribbon is that if you can't find it, right, all these places where they had commands have now been moved into the ribbon. So if you can't find it, it it's in the ribbon. And after a few weeks, then you'll say, man, if you can't find it, it's, it's somewhere in the ribbon, right? Uh, so it kind of changes over time. Second rule is if it's in the ribbon, you should use it from the ribbon, even if it's elsewhere. So I'm going to click on this because I taught my end users well. They say, delete the item. I say, OK. It says, OK, I'm going to delete it. And instead, it takes me to an error page. This is number one of nine. So come on, error page. It says it's deleting. And this nice little notification up here. There it goes. See this nice little dialog error? Cool, that's number one. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that I want to uh, pick the item. And then how many of you have users that might be tempted to use the ECB or the context menu? Yeah, maybe a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and pick delete item right off of there, even though we told them not to do that anymore. I click OK, and it gives me a totally different error page. Not in the dialog framework or anything. And then the business user is, is uh, tempted to click on go back to the site. When they don't even know where they came from. They're a totally different place. They don't even know what happened. And you're like, no, no, you were supposed to read the error message. So they call the help desk. Hey, there's a big problem with SharePoint. You can't delete anything. <laughs> Craziness. OK, so third way is if they choose the item, and then they say, uh, let's see, view the item and delete it. So they're going to get the actual dialog framework view of an item, pick delete off the, the ribbon, because they're trying to follow your example. You click OK, and it comes in, and it says, Totally different error with a correlation ID. Hey, I have a problem. 0A5FE392. Like, oh, gee, a minute, Christmas. They can't even see your message in there. It is in there. Please expire this item instead of deleting it, but it's horrible. All right, so I, I hardly have any time left. So I'm going to just quickly implement this so that you can see it working once, OK? Um, wow, how come I got all this stuff? Oh, I'm debugging. Oh, that's, that's crap. OK, so control. Control F5. I won't do that again. Or no, shift F5. So I never hit F5. F5 is, oof, takes forever and all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, OK, so I'm just going to collapse all this stuff up. I'm going to add one more thing. I'm just going to do it really quickly. I'm going to go ahead and add a new item. It's a module. So you can search all through these items, and you'll never find a module. You're going to have to use an empty element instead. The empty element, I'm just going to call my page module. Inside of my page module, I'm going to create a custom page. This custom page cannot have code behind. The code behind can't be there. Here's what's really frustrating. Um, if I, oh, you know what? There is a module. What am I thinking? There is a module element. Module elements are good. I won't have time to show you the housekeeping. Um, instead of an empty element, I am going to choose a module because the module gives me some functionality that I like. So page module. Inside of the page module, I get this uh, sample.txt, right? 
that's automatically going to get updated. So everything that I do to this folder, adding items will automatically update the XML, changing the names of files will automatically update the XML and stuff like that. If I right click on the spy itself and say I want to add an item, like, like a page, wouldn't it be nice if Visual Studio gave us the ability to put on a page here? So I'm going to search for page inside of all of, and there's no page. Um, application page and HTML page are the only ones that aren't CKS dev related, right? So how do I add a new page? Well, if you were working with the .NET framework from before it was released, like back in 2000 era, right? How did you make pages then? What was your tool of choice? Visual Studio couldn't do it, so you used, starts with an N. Notepad, yeah, right, so it's just a text file effectively. So if I make a text file here, and I call it display, display message dot ASPX. Instead of my display message page, I'll now have a new page that will automatically update the XML so that I can see that it's over there. The problem is that this display message page doesn't know how to be a page. So if I put in a page directive, I can use all the IntelliSense to make the page, right? You're a page, and you have a language, and your language is equal to C sharp, right? So I'm going to go ahead and pick all of that, and then it gives me a syntax error message. Not getting there quickly, but this will all get underlined, and it'll say, you can't do that. Here's why. It loaded the text editor, not the page editor. So to fix that, there we go. Now I get the thing that says syntax error, right? If I save that, close it, reopen it, it says, oh, an ASPX, I know what that is, and then it opens the page editor, and then you can start working with it. Um, I'm going to just grab the code out of, out of my code folder here for the, uh, for the page itself, copy that code, and paste it in. Um, just for, for time's sake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I had to do everything in script. You can go get this project off the mindtrap.com site, mindtrap.com, and click on free resources. Go get this project. You can read through this. It's basically saying you can't have code behind on this page and still be in a sandbox solution. So I had to deal with all the things that I would normally deal with in the code behind in JavaScript instead. So that's the key thing that you need to know about this. Um, I don't need the sample.txt file. And, oh, I am running off. I don't, I don't have power. That's why. This whole time, I haven't been running on power. There we go. Now I can see. I was going, why wouldn't it go brighter? OK. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier to do this whole talk if I had power the whole time. Uh, all right, so here's my display message. I'm going to go ahead and show that whenever I specify that that's what I want to do. Um, I need to change the elements.xml file to refer to it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just grab that real quick. Um, there's other things that I could do with housekeeping and stuff like that. Uh, come take my class, and I'll give you a really in-depth view of how you do you know, SharePoint event receiver building. For now, I'm going to go ahead and Control-Shift-B or uh, Alt-BD this guy out into the uh, SharePoint environment. They're actually ripping out the, uh, deactivating the feature, uh, retracting the solution, and then pushing it all back out into that site collection. This is a Sandbox solution, what happened? Require tag. Oh, 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 no, no, no it's just, that's just a iatrogenic anomaly there. Right, so I need to paste it into there like that. Um, I always map Alt BD as deploy all the projects in my solution, and then I map a keystroke, Control Shift D. Come on, what's going on here? Yeah, what should it be? See, copy and paste code, you know, in a demo, and there you go. That's what happens. Thank you for looking. All right, so that got deployed successfully. I can come, oh, 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 one more thing. In my actual code, so in my code here, I've got uh, three different things that I can do, right? I can either do cancel no error. That will actually go and say, let me delete, let me delete, let me delete in all three of those circumstances, and every time it just takes me back to the list. So I'm going to skip that one for just a moment. I'm going to jump clear to this cancel with redirect and show you just those three things. It'll take me one, one and a half more minutes. So I'm going to move that into my XML, right, where I said I had this data. So you can see I'm passing in a parameter so I don't hard code. I'm saying in this declarative context, I want to do that special block of code, which is the same code that we did before, just the case statement's going to take me down a different path. All right, does that make sense, everybody? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and redeploy that come back into my announcements list and see if I can delete it those three different ways. So I say delete the item. It says, are you sure you want to do that? It says deleting, and it takes me to a much nicer page. So if my business users are using the direction I've given them and following 
using the ribbon, right, that whole concept, this works great. I click on the back, they go back to the announcements list, everything's hunky-dory, unless they decide to choose to use the context menu, or what used to be called the ECB. If I pick the delete item from here, are you sure you want to do that? It says, error. I thought we wanted to get rid of this whole error idea. So I'm hoping that this is going to get fixed in the service pack. I'm going to say, go back to the site. And then finally, I'm going to go to the announcements list and choose the third and most catastrophic option, view item, and then use the ribbon to delete it. You say, please delete this. Are you sure you want to do that? Oh, it looks so nice. Please expire this in the dialogue framework and everything. And then we click back, and it destroys my browser. <laughs> so uh, let me just sum this up by saying, Event Receiver's incredibly powerful way for you to run imperative logic whenever somebody does something in the SharePoint context, right? Here's a super simple example that shows you how to tap into the new features that give us the power of sort of leveraging that, that context. All right, enjoy your day.